Welcome everyone to the new Fly Fisher. I'm your host, Phil Rowley. On today's show, we're coming to you from the luxurious Tuckamore Lodge, located near Mainbrook, Newfoundland. Our quarry today is Atlantic Salmon. We're gonna show you everything you need to know to catch these magnificent fish on the fly. Should be a great show, so stick around. On today's show, we visit the scenic northern peninsula of Newfoundland near the seaside town of Mainbrook as guests of Tuckamore Lodge. Tuckamore Lodge provides four-star accommodations and it's a short drive from a number of Atlantic salmon rivers and streams. In addition to Atlantic salmon, this region offers ecotourism along with a number of unique attractions such as Lance Meadows National Historic Site. Lance Meadows is home to an ancient Viking village, the earliest recorded settlement in North America. Wildlife abounds in the area. Visitors can expect to see moose, fox, birds, and whales. During the summer months, humpback and minke whales, along with Atlantic bottlenose dolphins, work the coastal waters. Icebergs are another natural beauty common to the area. The Atlantic salmon boasts a rich cultural heritage on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Atlantic salmon have a unique history and mystique that traces back over 25,000 years. Known scientifically as Salmo Salar, or the leaper, the Atlantic salmon is one of the most aggressive salmon species, although it is more closely related to the brown trout than its distant Pacific cousins. Atlantic salmon are speed merchants, capable of bursts in excess of 20 miles per hour and able to leap heights of 12 feet. Each spring, thousands of Atlantic salmon hatch from eggs laid in the previous autumn. After consuming their egg sacs from the Alevin stage, tiny Atlantic salmon fry wiggle free from their gravel reds and begin feeding on microscopic organisms. Fry grow and progress into small par that are easily identified by their aggressive nature and vertical markings. Par remain in their natal rivers for two to six years, feeding on an array of aquatic insects such as caddis larvae and mayfly nymphs. Par transform into silvery smolts. Their organs undergo a remarkable change, enabling them to adapt to life in salt water. Smolt migrate to sea where they spend one or more years. Fish that spend only one year at sea are known as grills. Grills are smaller fish, running between one to two kilograms or two and a half to five pounds. Salmon spend more than a year at sea and range from 4 to 20 kilograms or 10 to 40 pounds. <laughs> Got a little par here. Immature stage of the Atlantic salmon are so aggressive. And it's this aggressive tendencies we can take advantage of later in their life when they return in much larger sizes. And the par rise is very similar at times the uh, rise of an adult, a very small, uh, almost smutting rise uh, that can often be a large, large Atlantic. So we'll let this guy go, see if we can get his uh, older brother. Back at it. Not the biggest Atlantic, it uh, looks like a grills, which is a, in the life cycle of an Atlantic, is a fish that's gone out to the ocean for maybe one year and has returned. Atlantic salmon can spawn multiple times throughout their lifetime, unlike their Pacific cousins. There you go. Beautiful grills right there. You can see the fight a little grills like that gives. Imagine what a big brother is going to be like. So we're just going to unhook him. Let him get a drink. And we'll let him swim off. Whoops. And there he goes, off behind. So there you go, beautiful little grills. We're gonna head out there and see if we can catch us another one. As you can tell, we've got a beautiful day here. Um, one of the drawbacks of that though is its effect on water temperature. Atlantic salmon, like any uh, game fish, have a preferred temperature range. Theirs is about 58 to 62. So it's always a good idea to carry a small thermometer with you, take a temperature reading, and help eliminate water that's perhaps too hot for the uh, Atlantic salmon. So we're looking here at uh, 
Ooh, about 65, so we're a little warm here today. Um, so we're going to look for areas of oxygenated uh, water, um, such as uh, the current tongues you can see behind me here. So a th water temperature is a critical element to finding Atlantic salmon. Atlantic salmon, like all fish in rivers and streams, use underwater obstructions to protect themselves from the tiring effects of fighting current. Most fishermen are aware of the natural current breaks behind rocks, logs, and other similar objects. Atlantic salmon love to take advantage of the hydrodynamic cushion in front of large rocks and boulders. Whether using dry, wet, or riffle hitch wet flies, target the leading edge of large rocks and boulders using short, accurate, repetitive casts. The longer Atlantic salmon stay in the river, the less active they become. They simply get more focused on what they're here to do, and that's reproduce. So what you have to do is when you see fish moving in an area, and just off my left shoulder, we've had fish porpoising and rolling, is repeatedly work that area. Don't try to cover a large amount of water. Just work the water over and over again where they may be. With a dry fly, a riffled wet, or what we're doing here is swinging a blue charm through the run using a fluorocarbon leader to help get the fly down over and over and over again and induce a take that way. Just one of the tricks you can do when salmon are holed up and don't seem to be chasing the fly very much. I thought I'd take a moment to go over the basic equipment requirements for chasing Atlantic salmon on the fly. When it comes to rods, probably seven to nine weight, nine to nine and a half feet in length. Reels, a good quality fly reel with an excellent drag system, disc drag preferred, with lots of backing capacity. These fish grow big and can really take you for a run. A floating line is all you're allowed to use in Newfoundland Labrador by regulation. Lots to choose from out there. You might want to consider some of the salmon or steelhead taper lines. They have nice long bellies to facilitate mending and a tape, front taper that allows you to present dry flies delicately. Leaders, anywhere from 12 to 9 feet, from 8 to 12 pound is fine. You may want to consider fluorocarbon tippet for clear water situations. So there you go. Basic equipment, not very complicated, but a few special considerations. I'd take a moment to go through a series of flies that you might want to consider when you go out on your Atlantic salmon journey and we'll start with the dry flies and believe it or not your standard trout dries are a great place to start so this is a, a crystal winged royal wolf any of the wolf flies are a great uh, consideration uh, a royal humpy white wolf one of the myriad of bug flies that are out there bomber these are all great flies. Your standard trout flies anywhere from size 10 to 8. Uh, similar size range for your uh, bugs. And your bombers can be as big as a number 2. We've seen them in some of the stores here. But probably 6s and 8s and maybe a 4 are the most common. So there you go. Simple dry flies. Dead drifting is the best way to take Atlantic salmon. I'm going to take you through a series of wet flies you might want to consider. You can use wet flies both to riffle hitch and swing them traditionally through deeper runs and pools. Lots of them out there. Traditionally these were all tied on um, feather wings and now the hair wing variants are very popular and a lot easier to tie. So we've got a green cossaboom. We've got an undertaker, a dark bodied fly. Blue charm, a staple throughout Newfoundland and Labrador for that matter. Thunder and lightning and a silver doctor. So there you go, a simple selection of wet flies. Your Atlantic salmon box does not need to be complicated. Have a cross section of light bodied flies, dark bodied flies, even some silver flies like the silver doctor. Low water conditions, maybe size 10s and 12s, higher water, bigger water, number fours, 
then probably sixes and eights are your most common size. It doesn't have to be complicated. Just pick the ones you like and stick with them. It's midsummer here in Newfoundland and rivers like many across the continent are at their lowest flows. These call for low water tactics. First of all, think about being stealthy. Don't go crashing into the water nearest you. Fish those waters first. Often they hold fish. Fish also seek the deepest, most well oxygenated areas of the run. Off to my right, we're sitting across from the deepest part of the run and we've already seen a few salmon rolling there. Your fly box needs to be considered as well. You're going to look at probably more somber, smaller patterns for this time of year. For example, I've got an undertaker, a common wet fly in use. Typical flows, you might use a number six. In low, clear flows, you might want to consider a size eight, a 10, or maybe even a 12. Conversely, you could dress a fly low water style. This undertaker has a size four hook, but the body on the fly is a number eight. You get the benefit of the weight of the hook plus the smaller body on the fly. So keep these considerations in mind the next time you're faced with low water conditions. One of the primary presentation techniques for Atlantic salmon here in Newfoundland and Labrador is the dead drift dry fly. The challenge with this method is getting your fly to drift as though unencumbered by line or leader. Your fly line offers greater surface area and tends to pull or drag the fly if this isn't dealt with. And one of the techniques we can use is to correct the line by using a mending technique, either upstream or downstream. Let me show you what I mean. This is probably the most common men you'll use, typically used on faster flows like I have in front of me. It's gonna pick my cast up, lay it down, lift from a low rod position, and lay the line upstream of the fly. Just like that, low and lift. You wanna be gentle and deliberate with your movements. You don't wanna jerk the fly. So to pick it up, lay down, low rod, lift and lay upstream and allow the fly to drift downstream dead drift. The size of the water and the current speed will dictate how big a mending motion you have to make and how many times you have to make that motion throughout the presentation to keep your fly drag free. Now I'm gonna go over the downstream mend and this run here is a classic example. I've got faster water out where I want to present my fly and slower water close to me. The slower water is going to grab and hold the fly line which will drag the fly so it won't present naturally in the faster water. So to do this we have to use a downstream mend. Lay it down, lift and reposition and then follow the fly down. No matter which mending technique you use, a longer rod will allow you greater mending ability. I prefer rods nine feet or greater. Everybody likes to get salmon on a dry fly or a riffled wet. When, when salmon are active, they'll come up and chase these flies. But right now it's late in the season, the salmon are getting less and less active and you have to go down and get them. And we're doing that with an old traditional method called the wet fly swing. I've got a number six blue charm about nine feet of fluorocarbon leader and tippet. We use fluorocarbon because it sinks faster than traditional mono or copolymer leaders. And we're just making a quartering cast, basically off my shoulder, allowing the fly to sink on a tight line and following it around and just feeling for a bump or hopefully a good grab as a fish takes it. And it's as simple as that. The wet fly swing, it's very effective when fish aren't willing to chase the fly. That was a fish. Subtle, subtle peck. 
Thought I ticked a rock. But that's what we're doing. We're just trying to stay as tight to the fly as we can, mend and sink. And the fly, the takes are coming in this lower quadrant. The cast up here is to sink the fly and get it down. We're, we cannot use weighted flies, so we have to use a combination of the fly's weight and a fluorocarbon leader and time to let the fly drift through. And we know we're getting down because we're hooking bottom from time to time. Here we go, get the fly back. Just had a take. Fish on. Fish on. Fish on. Yeah. All right. Swinging the wet fly. I'm just at the uh, mouth of the river here. The fish are stacking up. They're a little dour. They've been in the river a while. Oh, this is a magnificent fish. Magnificent. We'll get them on the reel. The nice thing is, hopefully, if I can keep them on, because these are like uh, supercharged freight trains, that I can uh, use the shallow water my ex advantage, because he's got no rocks and things, hopefully, to wind me around. But you, what a magnificent jumping fish. That's why they call him the Salmo Salar, the leaper. And it's just a gorgeous fish. This is a nice, nice salmon. I think we've run into grills and other areas, but this seems to be a beautiful looking salmon. Right here. Oh, Junior's got his glove on. Use the tailing gloves to get a good grip on the fish without doing any harm. And he's right here in the shallows. Well, he's trying to go back out into the current. Use the full butt section of this eight weight to, to hold the fish. Yeah, it wants to go back to the to the current. Doesn't like the shallows that we're offering. So I'm just gonna back up a bit here. Sees Junior there, doesn't want anything to do with that. <laughs> Alright, he's going around your legs, Jim. He's going around behind. <laughs> he's over here in the shallows. I think we might be gaining the upper hand. That's a nice fish. Fresh fish, nice yeah, nice and silver. Look at that. There's that blue charm right in the scissors of the jaw. Good catch, Junior. Okay. Good job. Let's take that hook out. Here. Got my glove on. Oh, I got him. <laughs> Look at that. Is that a beautiful fish? Look at that. And you can see why they call him the leaper. This thing was cartwheeling, so we're going to give it time to recuperate, get some breath, and we'll let her go. And we, again, we were just doing the wet fly swing. When the fish, you know, they're not willing to move to the fly, so we're going to drift the fly down to them, and then on a tight line, swing it across, and they just reach up and grab it. But they're not taking it hard. It's late in the season. They're getting focused on their job at hand, which is reproduction. So we're just going to let this one swim graciously out of our hands, and away we go. There she goes. Wow. So there you go. If they won't take a riffle hitch, they're a, swung, or a dead drifted dry fly. Try swinging a wet fly in a traditional way. Fish on. Okay, there we go. We'll just bring her in. She's showing her sides. There we go. Just reach around. Whoop. One more swing ought to do it. And oh, they are slippery. They're one of the most slippery. I've caught lots of trout and salmon and steelhead on the fly, but these Atlantics are tough, tough quarry. To... There we go. There we go. I'll have Junior. Pop the fly out for me. All right. There we go. Stuck around the mat. Grab the rod there, Junior. All right. 
let the folks at home look at her. Gorgeous fish, and there's much, much bigger in here. These fish can grow well in excess of 20 pounds, so gorgeous fish. So we're gonna let her go, and we hope you've enjoyed today's show. Hope you've learned a little bit more about uh, how to fly fish for Atlantic salmon. Magnificent fish, if you get a chance, come out to Newfoundland and try this for yourself. They're a magnificent sport fish, and this one wants to go, and so it's time for us to go. So for all of us here at the New Fly Fisher, we hope you enjoyed the show. For more information on this and other shows in our series, please visit us on the World Wide Web at thenewflyfisher.com. Thanks for joining us, and let this girl go. Hi, I'm Mark Melnick. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, hit the like button and subscribe today. Now we're putting up brand new videos all the time, so if you want to be notified when a new one goes up, click that bell icon and it'll come to you as soon as it's uploaded.